Uh, Max Turgeon is our speaker today. Uh, great to have um, a discussion about text, um, text data. And um, Max, we done a journal club, uh, I guess it was in January on uh, data. I'm really interested in quality of text data uh, as we think about the applications of it and how to figure out how to assess quality. So this is a nice follow-up thinking also about the ways that we can um, organize and, and analyze text data. Uh, so Max Turgeon is an assistant professor who has a position that's joint between the Department of Statistics and the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he has been getting heavily involved in what goes on at the Bannatyne campus uh, through uh, participation on a variety of committees. He's also participated in the Bioinformatics and Biostatistics Journal Club um, because of the relevance of his work uh, in many areas, including in the health sciences. Um, uh, Max, I had not known this, that you were in Saskatchewan prior to coming here. You worked with the, with the um, uh, Saskatchewan Health Authority and also the Saskatoon Health Region. So connection to me because I spent time at the University of Saskatchewan. So glad to know that you were contributing your expertise in that, in that province. Uh, so I will, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Max, investigating text data using a uh, topological data analysis. So thanks so much, Max, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me and thanks Lisa, for the uh, introduction. I'll just share my slides right now. Uh, I'm actually joining you from Saskatoon, so I'm, I'm still in Saskatchewan. Uh, that's, I guess, one of the few perks of COVID is that I, I moved back to Saskatoon uh, teaching and working remotely because my wife uh, works here as a, as a physician. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> We're across provincial today, for sure. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> National. And still in the same time zone for an extra, an extra few days, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, today, today's topic is, as, as Lisa mentioned, is I, as you can see, uh, as the title of my slide here is, it's about investigating text data using typological data analysis. And um, you can think of this lecture or this uh, this talk as a bit of an introductory lecture on topological data analysis. Uh, I think maybe Junaid uh, has talked about this in the past in this group, or maybe it was a different group. Uh, but hopefully, what I what I hope you can get from this talk is um, why TDA or topological data analysis can be relevant for investigating text data, and also some of the tools that we can use um, and. Uh, hopefully, I can also share a little bit of uh, preliminary results about applying those tools to a specific data set on tweets from um, Canadian party, uh, well, Canadian political leaders. So that's sort of the idea. Uh, I'll switch to full screen. So you can see my slides, I suppose, just to make sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. They didn't go to full screen in terms of what we're seeing. So we oh. still see the bar along the side. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah, yeah okay. it is. It's gone to the, yeah, we're on the motivation side. Yeah, it's Excellent. good, thanks. So, so the, I guess the inception or the origin of this, uh, this project is uh, in my applied multivariate analysis course. There was, so students have to analyze the data set of their choice. So they really have full freedom, freedom in terms of finding a data set that interests them so that they can apply the tools uh, from my multivariate analysis course. And one student in particular uh, found a very original and different data set. So his name is Joshua Hamilton. Um, he wanted to analyze tweets from Canadian party leaders because the, uh, the federal election had just finished. And he was interested in particular to figure out if uh, multivariate analysis tools could uncover the main debate themes solely from the text data, right? So only looking at, um, at, the, at the tweets themselves, can we categorize them or classify them into the main themes that were covered during the, the debates? Um, and actually this project was uh, later further expanded uh, into an honors thesis. So, so Joshua actually uh, completed his honors thesis in computer science using this, this data set. And the, the conclusions were a bit um, unsatisfactory, I think. So yes, for some of the themes, he was actually able to, to make that connection, which was interesting. 
but the signal was actually very weak. Um, so one, one example of a weak signal was, for example, uh, indigenous issues, which was a, a theme in one of the debates and a certain number of tweets were related to this, but it was hard to really pick up on, on this using tools from multivariate analysis. Um, so the question remains, right? What, what is the best way to analyze such data or text data in general? Um, so here's the data set that Joshua collected. He has, um, well, we, he collected about 1400 English tweets from five party leaders, right? So Andrew Scheer, May, uh, Singh, Trudeau, and Bernier. Um, there's a, of course a sixth uh, party, the Bloc Québécois, but that party was ignored because actually he only tweeted, the leader only tweeted once in English. Um, so we wanted to keep this to just one language uh, to, to um, make this a little bit easier. So all the tweets were posted between September 10th and October 22nd in 2019. So that was essentially the, the campaign time. And then uh, Justin Trudeau is actually the leader who tweeted the most with about 400 tweets. And I was surprised when I saw that, but actually Jack Mate Singh was the leader who tweeted the least um, because you see him quite uh, being quite active on social media. So I was surprised by this lower number. Uh, but you can see that those numbers are actually quite small. It's not a, a huge data set, right? We only have about 200 to 400 tweets per leader. Um, here's, here's a quick visualization of these tweets. So on the X axis, we have time going from the beginning of the campaign to the end. And then uh, we have uh, on the Y axis, the number of tweets per day. So you can see that most leaders tweet every day uh, and usually between I don't know, two and, and five tweets per day. There was definitely a few busy days for Trudeau with over 25 tweets in the same day. I imagine those days where um, he was probably announcing um, some campaign promises. Um, yeah. So text data, if you've ever had to analyze this, um, the first question is how do you turn this into numbers, right? Because we're, most of the tools that, we're, that we use in statistics and machine learning, uh, the input is a matrix with numbers in it, right? And text data is definitely not numbers. So um, here's how this particular data set was cleaned and prepared, right? So each tweet was split into a collection of words so, um, yeah, that's what we call the bag of words model in, in uh, natural language processing. So we decided to go with that model because it fit quite nicely with the tools that uh, Joshua was interested in using. Um, we had to clean this up a little bit because some of the words are hard to, um, to use. So hashtags were removed, mentions to other Twitter handles were removed. Uh, stop words, which are words that don't carry much meaning, like the word and or it or they, uh, those were all removed. And emojis were also removed um, and numerical digits, so numbers, right? So some of the campaign promises said things like we're going to invest, I don't know, 15 million in this or that. Uh, so those, those digits were removed as well. And then after all this cleaning up, some of the tweets had less than four tokens or words left. Uh, so we, we, remo we removed them as having too little uh, information. So the output of this whole data cleaning and preparation is a matrix that's about 1200 rows. Each row is a different tweet. And then we had just short of 4,000 uh, columns and each column actually represent a word. Each column represents a word, right? So we call that a document term matrix. So um, you can see from those numbers, what we have is uh, high dimensional data, right? A lot more variables or features than observations, right? More than twice as much. So that's already one, um, one challenge from analyzing this type of data. Unless you have lots of documents or lots of tweets, uh, very often you'll end up with high dimensional data. Um, yeah, here's a quick idea of what, what are the common words from each of the leaders. Um, some of these are, you can, if you remember the campaign, you can probably um, think about some of the promises they made. But for example, if we look at um, Justin Trudeau, there's a couple of the most, most common words are gun and rifles. 
which was related to some of these promises. Um, if you look at Bernier, you can see some of the, I don't know, rally, rallying cries. So freedom, deficit, alarmism. Um, Denta care was a big promise from the NDP, right? So those, those words uh, that are the most common um, definitely make sense in terms of the global context of that uh, election campaign. Um, yeah, just maybe a quick word. So this is measured, the, I say most common, this is measured in terms of a metric that's called a TFIDF, so term frequency and inverse document frequency. Uh, it's a very common metric for text data. I'm not going to use it that much. I'm not going to go back to it, so I won't really define it precisely. But the idea is that it measures how uh, common a word is in a particular tweet, uh, but also compared to uh, other tweets, right? So if a word is if a word appears in all of the tweets, it's going to receive a measure of zero because it's it's too common. Uh, but if it's a word that appears often in a tweet, but only in a, in a handful of tweets, then it, it gets a high measure. So it's a balancing of how often you see a word, but also how um, frequent it is, or uh, sorry, how um, specific it is to a, a subset of documents or tweets. Okay. And so my background is in dimension reduction. Um, multivariate analysis. So if I have a big matrix like this and I want to understand it better, um, very often I'll, I'll just run a quick PCA on it. And for text data, um, it's it doesn't work very well. And you can see that if I do this, it looks a bit weird on my laptop. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> you can see that it's hard to really um, read anything from this. So first of all, there's most of the, the points are bunched up in the in the middle near the, the origin. And then we have these two weird rays. Um, and then we don't really see any obvious clustering from the, of the points, which is often something we see from uh, data um, P, uh, analyzed through PCA. And then finally, if you look at the percentage of variance explained, um, so the first PC explains about 2%, the second PC also 2%. Um, so there's um, those PCs, those PC coordinates or those PC projections don't carry much information on their own. The, the information is sort of spread out across all of the dimensions. So that was sort of the starting point for looking at uh, topological data analysis. The usual tools that we use in multivariate analysis don't work very well with this type of data. And um, so the rays that I pointed out to, uh, they're evidence of non-normality, which is not super, super surprising. Uh, I was not necessarily expecting this data to be normal. Um, but the main challenge here is that actually the matrix is very, very sparse. Uh, few words appear in more than one um, tweet. And so actually that big matrix is over 99% sparse. So it's mostly zeros. And the data is also high dimensional, as I mentioned. So more features than, than observations. So those are the main challenges that uh, you face with traditional methods uh, when applying them to um, to text data, or traditional dimension reduction methods, I should say. OK. So um, as I mentioned, this, this idea that we have high dimensional data, uh, very often, as, at least as statisticians, will quickly jump to um, this curse of dimensionality. right? So high dimensional data suffers from the curse of, high dim of dimensionality. What does this mean? It means that there's lots of empty space in high dimensions. So neighboring observations are actually quite far apart. So for example, if you do K means, uh, sorry, K nearest neighbors, the K neighbors you'll find are probably very far from your observation. And so maybe they're actually not very, um, they, they're not very similar to your observation. Um, second is that most points are far away from the mean. Um, that's also a, a feature of high dimensional data. And then of course, big matrices lead to computational challenges. Um, so that's the curse of dimensionality, but actually is the curse as bad as it seems? Well, not, not that much because empirical observations suggest that um, it's, the curse is not as bad as expected. 
And the reason for this is that most of those results are derived by assuming variables are independent, which is almost always false. Uh, and actually big data matrices are approximately low rank. <clears throat> so this leads to sort of a main theme in my research is we can actually mitigate this effect of, high, of the curse of dimensionality by exploring the structure in the data. Um, so I have a, a couple, of, so this, this is sort of the motivation for a lot of the sparse methods that you're probably familiar with, like lasso regression, elastic net, or the graphical lasso for um, precision matrices. Um, you can also use structured covariance estimators. And here I'm just um, referencing one of the papers from my PhD thesis. So by exploring the structure, we can make the curse um, not as bad as it may seem at first, or at least not as bad as, as the theory predicts. And we can turn this into our advantage. And so this is where topological data analysis comes in. So uh, a very, uh, one way to uh, study the structure in our data is to look at how this, um, the, uh, what are the geometric constraints that our data has, right? So for example, for text data, that's very natural because we know as, as speakers, right, as humans, we know that text is definitely not a, a random, um, a random thing, right? It's not just a random collection of words and, and, and characters. There's high structure to text data. Um, and so we expect this to be part of the, of the, of the data set that we analyze, right? We, we expect to be able to recover that structure. And so topological data analysis allows us to study the geometry of the sample space. So where, where's the, the data coming from? And uh, it's a fairly new field and it has its roots in computational geometry and computational linear algebra. Um, and of course, uh, some branches of, of pure mathematics as well. But it's, it's been su successfully used to study constraints in the sample space. Uh, I'll give a few examples later on. Um, some examples fr come from natural pro uh, language processing, but it's been used in many, many fields. In genomics, it's been used in to understand the output of fitting deep neural networks and understanding uh, targets for adversarial attacks, for example, um, et cetera. So today, what I want to do is to talk a bit about topological data analysis in general, how we can apply it to text data. Um, but I want to focus on two different techniques uh, from this field. The first one is called persistent homology. And then the second one is called the mapper algorithm. Uh, and if, if Junaid, I, I can't remember if Junaid gave a talk, but I suspect he probably focused on the mapper algorithm. Okay. Any questions so far? No, it's a good introduction, Max. Thanks for setting the stage. Okay. Yeah. So here's a, <laughs> a crash course in algebraic topology. So uh, my background is in, in my, uh, when I did my undergraduate studies, I was actually a student of pure math, and then I did a master's in pure math. So I, I took lots of courses in those fields of pure mathematics, but I, I know that's um, un uncommon. So hopefully I can give you a sort of quick idea of what uh, algebraic topology is, because it's sort of the foundation for the, the methods in topological data analysis. So <clears throat> topology is a field of pure math. And the idea is to study shapes um, or, yeah, shapes or geo, uh, geometric shapes, but independently of coordinate systems or distance functions, which is usually uh, or, or the, first, the first way we learn about how to study shapes. And I remember one of, one of my teachers used to call it primitive geometry. So it's a geometry without the coordinate systems. And so that's topology as a field. And then as a subfield, we have algebraic topology. And the idea of algebraic topology is to bring in tools from abstract and linear algebra to study and classify shapes. And um, one of the techniques in algebraic topology is called homology, which is related to one of the tools I'll talk about. But the idea of homology is that if I have this geometric shape or this geometric space, I want to be able to attach a series of vector spaces to it. And um, those vector spaces are sort of well coordinated together. 
they're also invariant under um, continuous transform uh, de deformations of our data. So if I have, for example, um, a donut shape and I slightly bend it, right? It's essentially the same, sh the same shape. And so homology says that those um, numbers or sorry, those vector spaces shouldn't change when I slightly bend my, my donut. Uh, but we'll be focusing on not the whole space itself, but the dimension of these vector spaces. And those dimensions are called the Betty numbers. And um, we attach, uh, so essentially we have uh, for any natural number from zero to infinity, we could attach those vector spaces to our geometric shapes. For each of those vector spaces, we have a Betty number, which is the dimension. And so the, uh, the conclusion of all this is that we start for, with our shape and then we end up with just a sequence of numbers, a sequence of integers, really, um, positive integers. <clears throat> and so this allows us to, um, I guess, more, um, to, I guess, to simplify the problem a little bit. So starting from our big shape that we don't know much about and are not sure how to study it, and then attach to it a sequence of numbers and then if we have two different shapes, we could we would have two different sequences of numbers and then we could compare them. And if the sequences are different, then we know that our shapes are different. That's essentially the idea of homology. Um, but the Betty numbers also count important topological features. So the zero, zeroth Betty number counts the connected components. And so, and counting the connected components is a bit like clustering data, right? Uh, connected components would be, yeah, disconnected, I guess. So you would think of data that's generated on one connected component to be clustered independently of uh, data generated from a second connected component. So those, those are important. And then the first Betty numbers count the number of holes and then cavities and other topological features of our data set, uh, of, our, uh, of our shapes. So that was a quick, yeah, a crash course, as we say, right, in algebraic topology. Um, but so far, I've only talked about shapes. So where's the data? So here's the main assumption we'll make, is that we'll assume that our high dimensional data lives on or near a lower dimensional uh, space that I call the manifold, right? Um, and so that's one way to model the data constraints that we have in our data set. Um, so a finite data set itself is not a very interesting topological space. So the, the main idea of persistent homology and many of the tools in, in topological data analysis is that uh, we'll construct a different topological space using our data set. That Topological space is what we call a simplicial complex. And I'll, I'll explain what it is in a, in a, on the next slide. And those simplicial co uh, complexes are very interesting topological sp spaces. Uh, we know lots about them. And in particular, we can compute those Betty numbers uh, quite efficiently, actually. <clears throat> so that's our main assumption here. Uh, that, that's connecting the high dimensional data to topological data analysis. We're assuming that our, our data is not just filling up this whole high dimensional space, but rather it's living close to a lower dimensional space, yeah, a lower dimensional manifold. <clears throat> okay, so a simplicial complex, uh, as I said, it's a topological space and it's constructed as the convex hull of subsets of points. And that's what we call the simplex. So a convex hull is the largest convex, uh, sorry, the smallest convex um, space or shape that contains all of our, all of our points. And um, that's not just why, there's also a, like a list of um, conditions that are attached to this. It's not just a collection of, of simplices. Uh, there's also some internal consistency rules that they have to satisfy, but I'll, I'll skip those uh, for the moment. I'll, because I'll show you a couple examples of those. So there's many ways of constructing simplicial complexes from um, a set of points, but we'll consider two constructions here. And there's gonna be a, a free parameter here called R, which is a radius. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So the first one is the check complex. And uh, the way to construct it is that the data points themselves uh, will be simplices. So there's, there's zero dimensional simplices. And then for a subset of K points, we can put an open ball of radius R around each of those points. And if the intersection of, um, of those balls, so we have K balls, if the intersection is non-empty, then uh, we consider the convex hull of those K points to be a simplex in our simplicial complex. I have a picture on the next slide. <clears throat> uh, the other construction we'll consider is the Vittori rips complex. And the starting point is the same. So each data point is a zero uh, dimensional simplex. And then a subset of K points will be considered a sub uh, or its convex hall will be considered a simplex if all of the points are at most a distance of two R apart of each other. So those two things are slightly uh, different. And here's a picture maybe uh, to clarify this. So here I have, um, I fixed R. I have six points, and around each of those six points, I'm putting uh, a ball, right? So an open disk around them. And you can see here on the, uh, well, I guess on both slides that um, there's a triangle here. <clears throat> well, I guess, okay, but first of all, let me backtrack a little bit. So our zero, uh, zero dimensional simplices are the points. And then we can look at each pair of points. And if, um, if for those two points, those open balls intersect, then we have a one dim dimensional simplex, which is just uh, a line segment. Next, we can look at triples of points. And if, so on the left for the check simplex, if the intersection of the three disks is non-empty, then we have a two-dimensional simplex, which is a triangle here. And so you can see that there's a triangle on the, on the right, which is pink, because the intersection is non-empty. But uh, we have a triangle that's not pink on the left, because the intersection of those three uh, disks is actually empty. Right? We can see that they don't intersect. All three don't intersect. And so the difference between the check and the rips complex is that uh, even though the three balls don't intersect on the left, uh, the points themselves are still at most, they're still less than two R distance apart. And so um, those two constructions can actually give us different um, uh, simplicial complexes. Okay. Um, Okay, so this this slide sort of makes the connection between the data set and, and the, the different constructions and also algebraic topology in general. So an important theorem in algebraic topology, which is called the nerve theorem, can be used to give us consistency results about the topology of the check complex and the topology of the underlying manifold, right? The manifold on which our data lives. So as you could as you could imagine, um, the more points you have, the more certain you can be that the topology of your uh, check complex is the same or it's close to the topology of your underlying manifold. So this is the sort of results that can be derived using the NERF theorem. But that's about the check complex. So the the RIPS complex, uh, we can still give consistency results about it. Uh, using the fact that uh, the RIPS complex is sort of, well, I guess the check complex rather is uh, sandwiched between two RIPS complex. And so doing a bit of geometry, you can check that these, uh, this relationship is, is uh, holds, I guess. And so we can translate co those consistency results to the Vittori RIPS complex. Uh, and so in other words, given enough points, given a well-behaved sample space, and an appropriate radius r, we can compute Betty numbers for the simplicial complex. And those Betty numbers should be close to the Betty numbers for uh, the sample space. So that's the connection between uh, all of those things, right? That's, that's how we can compute 
uh, the homology of our sample space by using a data set. Okay. Any questions on this? Those, those last few slides were pretty technical uh, and full of text, I can see now. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I said that we need to choose a good R. So that's where persistent homology comes in, right? So how do we choose the right R? Persistent homology tells us uh, you don't have to choose. You can just do it for a bunch of Rs and then uh, combine the results together. So persistent homology, the idea is to compute the homology for a sequence of simplicial complexes. So we, we do it for a small R, for a slightly bigger R, and then for a larger R. So the idea here is that uh, we know what the, the homology is going to be for a very small R, because if you put very small open disks around the data points, there's none of those disks are going to intersect. So what you'll get is a simplicial complex with just those points, no other higher dimensional simplices. And so your, Betty, your zeroth Betty number is going to be n because there's n uh, connected components. And then all of the other ones are going to be zero. On the other extreme, if you have a very large R, then all of those disks are going to intersect. And so uh, the zeroth Betty number is going to be one because now you only have one connected component. Everything is connected to each other. And all of the other uh, Betty numbers are going to be e equal to zero because you don't have loops or holes or anything like that. And so the idea is that uh, as we change R, as R goes from very small to very large, we're looking for topological features that persist over a long range of R values. So that's the idea behind persistent homology. And if they persist over a, uh, over, over a long range of R values, then this is evidence that this is probably a true feature, a true top topological feature of the sample space, right? So here's a picture and hopefully it's going to make a bit of sense, a bit more sense. Um, so we'll start with the first, the first one, uh, A. So that's when you have a very, very small R. And as I said, if you have a very small R, then none of the disks are going to intersect. And uh, we can visualize this or encode this using uh, a persistence barcode, which is the, the graph right next to the figure. And um, so we have one connected component for each dot. So each data, uh, yeah, each point in the data set. And so we will encode this as saying that this connected component uh, is born when R is very small. And then eventually this will, will I guess this connected component will, will die, right? So we can think of this line, this vertical uh, horizontal red line as encoding the time of birth and death of this connected component. So next, if we look at B, we can see that we've increased the radius a little bit. And now some of those um, disks intersect. So some of those connected components actually merge together. And we can see this in the graph next to it um, when we see that some of those uh, bars are slightly smaller than others. That's because some of those connected components are no longer um, connected components, right? They've merged with another one. And if we keep increasing like this, eventually we can reach this uh, figure, uh, the, the, the figure C, where now um, we only have one connected component. All of those uh, disks intersect with at least, an, at least another one. So we, we have just one connected component. Uh, but now we actually have two loops. And those loops are um, what the first Betty number is counting. And so we can see now, so there's only one red line that still survives, but we have two uh, blue lines corresponding to the birth of those uh, loops. And then again, if we keep increasing, the first one of the loops is going to uh, disappear because now all of those points have a common intersection. And we're, le we're left with still just one connected component, but just one loop now. And so you can see there's one blue line that's a bit longer than the other ones or the other one. 
And eventually, if we keep increasing, as I said, uh, we only get one connected component, no more loops, no more holes, no more cavities. <clears throat> and so on the last uh, graph here, the last barcode, we can see there's just one line that's still surviving all of this. So that's, that's the idea of persistent homology. <clears throat> um, some of those uh, components or some of those features actually survived much longer than other ones. Um, and those barcodes are often translated into a persistence diagram where on the X axis, you have the time of birth for a, a certain topological feature and the Y axis is the time of death. So if you have points on the diagonal, those would be uh, points that uh, are born and die very quickly, right? So that they don't uh, persist over a long range, they actually appear and then disappear right away. So what you would want uh, for persistent features is uh, anything that's uh, away from the diagonal. And so there's always going to be this one point, uh, one red point very high up that was born at the beginning and then died when you essentially uh, stopped increasing R. And this is the connected component, right? There's at least one connected component. And then those two blue dots are the, the two loops that we saw. So one of them died uh, or persisted over a smaller range and that's why it's further away from the diagonal. So this is a way to visualize um, the topological features, but also visualize how, how they persist over, over time or over the range of our values. Okay. So that's, that's what I wanted to discuss about persistent homology in terms of what, how does it work and what's the theory behind it. Uh, now it's time to jump back to the data analysis. How do we actually apply this to data and what can we uh, get out of applying it? So remember that we're analyzing tweets from political leaders. Um, and the one question you, you may be asking or maybe wondering about is, can we find evidence that these political leaders uh, tweet differently? And so what I did is I split the big matrix I had into five smaller matrices, one for each leader. Uh, and, and then I also reduced the dimension slightly with PCA because, um, because we had about 200 rows and but still 4,000 words. So I reduced the dimension to about 100. And then uh, you can compute persistent homology on this reduced data. And I did this using a very nice suite of, of libraries in Python called scikit-tda. Uh, if you've used scikit-learn to do machine learning, this, this is very similar in terms of uh, API. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very nice. And so this is the persistence diagrams that I got uh, for each leader. And I apologize, this looks a bit smaller than I thought. Uh, but you can see that we, so we have two different colors of points and the blue ones correspond to H0, so the zeroth Betty number. And again, I wanna remind you of this, uh, those numbers are counting the number of connected components. And um, the orange dots are corresponding to the first Betty numbers. And those dots are counting the number of loops essentially in our, in our data. Um, so the first observation is that there's essentially no loops, right? All of the orange dots are pretty much on the diagonal. So uh, there's not much evidence for any loops in the data sets. Um, on the other hand, we can see that uh, there seems to be a different number of connected components um, for the different leaders. So I can see, for example, Andrew Shear, there's two, maybe three connected components for his tweets, um, but for Justin Trudeau, there's, there's essentially just one connected component, right? And you, you can actually do bootstrap on those persistent um, persistence diagrams and add sort of a band um, to get a sense of which, which dots are actually significant and which ones aren't. Uh, I haven't done this yet on this, but you could imagine sort of a, a band uh, just above the diagonal <clears throat> that would tell you which ones are not significant. So I would, I would conclude from this that Andrew Scheer has maybe two connected components and then uh, Justin Trudeau only has one. 
Um, so they're, they're probably different uh, sample spaces. Um, so one more thing you can do with this is you can actually measure the distance between the persistence diagrams. There's a few different ways of doing this. Um, I won't go over the definitions, but there's a, a distance called the bottleneck distance. Um, and you can use it to compare the zeroth homology, right? So the zeroth Betty numbers. So the blue dots essentially. And uh, so I you can measure the difference or the distance between the, the persistence diagrams and to measure how far apart they are. So this is what I did. This is what you can see on the, on the left. Um, and you can see, for example, that the largest uh, distance is uh, between uh, Elizabeth May and Maxime Bernier, <laughs> which seems to me to make a lot of sense. Um, they're very, very different in terms of pretty much everything. Uh, and then the closer, uh, the closest pair of persistence diagrams is actually uh, Andrew Shear and Jack Meet Singh. And um, so this is a distance matrix. So if you want to visualize a distance matrix, you can use multidimensional scaling, uh, which is going to do something very close to PCA, but on a distance matrix. And you get this, uh, this nice graph in two dimensions and you can visualize uh, the, the points. And so, Right, you can see how uh, Maxime Bernier, which is the uh, purple uh, dot, is very far apart, apart from Elizabeth May, which is the green dot. Uh, and you can also see how Andrew Shear and Jack Mead Singh are fairly close in space. <clears throat> um, one thing that's kind of interesting is you could think about uh, rotating this, this graph counterclockwise, and you could, you could see how the dots projected onto the x-axis would be uh, aligned in the expected order, right? So Elizabeth May would be the furthest left, Maxim Bernier would be the furthest right, and then uh, Trudeau would be between Jack Mead Singh and, and Andrew Scheer, which is kind of a neat um, uh, byproduct, I guess, of this graph. Okay, <clears throat> so um, yeah, I think I've, I've already mentioned this a little bit. So the most two distant leaders are from the two smallest parties, but also, uh, yeah, um, Politically, we know that they're very different. Um, Andrew Scheer and Jack Mead Singh during the campaign had very similar goals, right? Or a very similar goal, which is what, which is uh, replacing Justin Trudeau. So it could explain why they're close, right? Because uh, maybe they're talking more about governance. Maybe they, they have similar uh, critiques of the government. <clears throat> and so that could explain why they're closer in space like this. Um, yeah, Jack Mitzing is closer to Elizabeth May than Maxim Bernier, and the opposite is true for Andrew Scheer, which uh, aligns with our expectations in terms of uh, left-right politics. And yeah, the last point is what I just mentioned, right? So I don't think I learned anything crazy about this data set um, using topological data analysis, but it was reassuring that I could at least make sense of some of those observations. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and ask questions about this or make comments. Um, but these oh, well, things, yeah. Yeah, Max, so I'll start just with one question. When we, when we think about, so it's around, it's around the, the words or the sentiments that are expressed in here. It's, it's completely about the words that are used, right? And, yes. and yeah, okay. So, um, because I'm thinking also about kind of the sentiments or the positive and negative mm -hmm. uh, attributes of that and how it, how it might work with this kind of, but it's, it's focusing just on the words themselves. That's right, uh, yeah. yeah. Looking at sentiment would be interesting, I think. Uh, this is really just about co-occurrence of words, right? Yeah. So which words yeah. appear together, yeah. That's right. Okay, thanks. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask at this point? So more, yeah, okay, so maybe I'll just continue then. Um, yeah, thanks. So more generally, uh, so th this was using persistent homology on this particular data set, but more generally it's being used also for feature extraction in text data. So you, um, and I have a reference there. You can think, for example, of um, computing those persistence diagrams uh, with and without a certain feature in your data set. And then you could, so that way you could classify them in terms of importance. So the features that change the homology the most are probably the mo most important features. 
So that's one way to do this. Um, you can, it was also used for document uh, clustering and classification, um, which is also a, an interesting use of persistent homology for text data. Um, persistence diagrams are actually, they can be used themselves as features, uh, especially they work well with kernel methods uh, for prediction. So I haven't really explored this, but this is one avenue uh, for using this in, in, in data analysis and prediction models. Uh, and then of course, uh, this is for text data, but it's gaining popularity in, in other fields as well. So social network analysis, change point analysis, analysis of time series, analysis of uh, genomic um, data. And as I alluded to also understanding deep neural networks and trying to find targets for adversarial attacks uh, or understanding the activation network of, of some of those uh, deep models. So it's, it's used in many, many different ways. Um, my experience so far with this method is that it's much more exploratory than anything else. Um, but it can be a good way of looking at your data differently and hopefully getting a somewhat different insight that other methods would give you. Okay. Um, right, I, I thought I would actually go through those slides much quicker than this. <laughs> so let's talk about the, the second algorithm. Um, so the mapper algorithm, which is probably where, uh, or the starting point for why TDA was, was, uh, has, has gained uh, popularity recently. So it's a way to visualize high dimensional data. Um, and of course, PCA and manifold learning is also a way to visualize high dimensional data. Um, so you can think of these as being complementary in that aspect. Uh, but the, the main idea is that we want to study our data set by looking at its uh, projection or its image under a function f that we choose. And I'll, I'll explain which functions you can choose. <clears throat> so here's the, the main algorithm is you start with the data, you start uh, the data set, you start with a function f. And then um, the image of your data set under this function f, uh, you want to cover it by, with a set of intervals. So I'll call this set of intervals uh, u, right? So the first step is that for each interval u, so that's, that's an interval on the real line, you can look at its pre-image in, uh, by using f. So essentially what you're looking for is all of the points in your data set that are mapped into, onto this interval u. And so you get a subset of your data set and then, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. And then you cluster this, this subset of your data set. And for each of the clusters that you, find, that you found, you can draw a node, right? So we're going to represent our data using a graph. And so you do this for all of your uh, intervals. And so some of those intervals will have overlap in terms of the data that's been projected to it, right? If, because if you have overlapping intervals, there's a chance that you get a point that's mapped uh, to both intervals. And so the nodes corresponding to the cluster, you're going to connect a pair of nodes if, they, if their corresponding clusters have a non-trivial intersection or they have at least one point in common. And so in this way, you get a graph that's, uh, that, that can help you visualize your function, uh, sorry, your high dimensional data set. And let's look at an example here uh, from the same paper as before, Chazal and Michel. So, we have a data set here, which is um, essentially a point sampled from a circle, but with a bit of noise. And we have this function f. And um, we can see that the, the image of the data set is covered by three intervals, a red one, a blue one, and a yellow one. And so you can think of going into the medium. Oh, excuse me? Sorry, Carson. Do you have a question? Okay. Uh, so we have three intervals. <clears throat> and so if we start with the, the red one, for example, we can think of all the points in our data or on our circle that map to this red interval. And those points are uh, in the uh, red dashed rectangle. And if you cluster this, then um, you can get, I mean, there's essentially just one cluster. <clears throat> so we get one node and that node appears on the extreme right here. And then we can repeat this with the other two intervals. 
the blue interval, it's the same thing. You only get one cluster and you get one blue point. <clears throat> and then the middle interval, the yellow one, uh, we get two clusters. So we get two points. And then we can go back and see which of those clusters have a non-trivial intersection. <clears throat> and this is how we get our, um, our edges here. And so this is, of course, a toy example, but you can see how uh, this graph is sort of a cartoon version, I guess, of the original data set, but also of the underlying sample space, right? If you, can th if you think of the sample space as a circle, and then the data, the data points are generated from a circle and with, then with some noise, you can see that this graph looks like the underlying circle. So they should have the same topology. Right, which is the idea here. Um, so you have to choose a few things in the mapper algorithm, which makes it a bit finicky. Uh, you have to choose the set of intervals. You have to choose a clustering algorithm. And so different algorithms will give you different answers. Uh, but all, you also have to choose f. <laughs> and so choosing the right function f will have a significant impact on the resulting graph. Um, so common choices, uh, you can use a density function. So if you think of, for example, F being um, multivariate normal density, uh, you could use that to map your points in high dimensional space to uh, a value on the real line. You can also you use uh, PCA coordinates. So you could think of doing PCA on your data set and then you're looking at the first PCA as your projection or as your function F or you could fix the point somewhere in your high dimensional space and then your function f would be the distance uh, from all data points to this fixed point. So those are common choices and they will all give you different graphs. So again, this is very much a, a data visualization or an exploratory tool more than a, an, an analytical tool. Max, I'm, I'm yeah. just mindful of, of yeah. the time and the opportunity to have uh, let people um, ask some questions if, if they have. So it might um, be good so to I'll just wrap. wrap. Thanks. So I'll wrap up. Thanks. Um, so very, very, uh, it's not a very long story, but I'll make it even shorter. Uh, I applied this to my data set and I didn't get much. <laughs> and I think it's because I have to tweak the, all of those parameters. Uh, so the function F itself, I used the, the TC uh, coordinates, um, but also probably the intervals weren't really the, the, the correct ones. So actually the only thing I got is two connected components, no connections between them and we, we can't read much into this. Um, but I know that it's been successfully used for topic detection. And uh, here's a paper by Junaid on Bitcoin ransomware prediction. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll stop here uh, and, and take some questions. Thanks so much, Max. Yeah, all right. So um, I'll open it up for questions people have. So I, I'll start, oh, go ahead. Okay, I'll jump in then. Uh, uh, thanks very much, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you were able to take your distance function on the, uh, uh, from the, the uh, earlier slides and <laughs> rationalize why uh, uh, there was uh, closeness or, or distance between some of the, uh, some of the leaders. I'm just wondering, uh, are you able to dig into those connected components and see uh, what is actually in those connected components and sort of rationalize uh, uh, why those uh, cluster together? Right. So um, I haven't looked into that, but that would be a good natural step, um, a good natural next step, right? So as I sort of alluded to, one, one thing we can do is uh, remove some of those features and see how much it changes the, the persistence diagrams. So that could be one way of figuring out which uh, features or which words are driving the differences between the, um, the, the diagrams. Uh, but one key question, which is sort of completely uh, missed from topological data analysis is how can you actually reconstruct the manifold, right? So we know there are holes. How do we know where those holes are? 
because holes in this particular case for text data will correspond to uh, sets or yeah subsets of words that are never occurred uh, that are never uh, put together in a tweet. So it could give us some information about what some leaders say versus what they don't say. Um, so that would be an interesting byproduct, but uh, uh, but unfortunately, it's it's not something that TDA can can help us with. Where are the holes? Yeah, that's the the main question I have. Oh, thanks. And maybe I'll ask um, just one question. I wonder too, Max, about, so when you think about uh, the tweets that are coming out and the, the atypical characteristics of them in relation to other kinds of text, and I wondered also about, about how the pre-processing, so decisions that you made, that you make even about how you deal with, because there are a lot of like abbreviations and so forth in the data and how that might influence the results. Right, so that's uh, I think that's a very tricky thing to do when you analyze uh, tweet data. Um, this was a small sample, so I could go over and look at maybe some of the abbreviations and see if I could parse them out. Um, but yeah, it's always going to be something uh, a limitation, I guess, of using tweet data uh, as opposed to political speeches or news articles or things like that. Yeah, yeah, unique characteristics. And I think about how that extends over into things like electronic medical records, like what content is in them, because it would be, it would be similar. They're very short texts, mm -hmm. right? So very uh, short um, uh, texts and, and might be filled with a lot of abbreviations and look uh, quite different, but, um, yeah. less, uh, yeah. Yeah, j less just formal than, than other kinds of documents. So and how that might influence just the performance of methods. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good observation. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a good solution for it. But, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, I think we'll stop at that today. Thank you so much, Max, for leading us through that. Another tool for analysis of text data. Uh, I'm sure raises a lot of questions for people. So okay. thank you so much. And uh, Bill, you've given us the teaser about what's coming next. next yeah. Watch for it. Watch for the invite. It'll be fun. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah. And thanks everybody for joining today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye everyone. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you so much.